Welcome to an overview of my latest book, Systems and Subjects, Thinking the Foundation of Science and Philosophy. You can find a link in the description to both a free preview of this book, as well as a link to the official Amazon page where you can buy a physical copy. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Cadell Last. What I tried to do in the book Systems and Subjects is think dialectically via speculative cognition at the level of science and subjectivity. I think this is a critical move today, and I hope to demonstrate in this presentation both my framing and my approach to this problem. I was trained as an anthropologist. I have both a bachelor's and a master's in evolutionary anthropology. I've also been trained as a philosopher, and the result of my long training can be found in a PhD thesis titled Global Brain Singularity. There will be links in the description to both that text and my doctoral defense of that text. Throughout my postdoctoral research, I had the great opportunity and pleasure to study at the Berta Lanfrey Center for the Study of System Science. And the result of my research there both focused on the work of Ludwig von Berta Lanfrey, as well as the contemporary literature resulted in this text, Systems and Subjects. I think that this is necessary for our time, to think at the relation or the gap itself between complex systems and phenomenologic of subjectivity itself. Oftentimes, we can have too much focus on complexity of systems, which purports to lead towards interdisciplinary work, but at the same time leaves out the self-referential dimension of the relation to the subject and the way in which the subject is engaged in complex systems and is interacting with others. In this text, I try to explore what a discourse might look like that broke down this barrier. My grounding for this work is in the pioneer of system science, Ludwig von Berta Lanfrey. He was trained as a biologist and was deeply concerned with the complexities of life and mind, the relationality of complex society and information technology. Of course, our societies have always been complex, and of course, humans have always developed technology, even information technologies. However, the level of complexity of our society and the importance of information technology in our society today opens us up to a qualitatively new existence for both our life and our mind, as well as their interactions. Berta Lanfrey's idea of system science was an attempt to update a form of science which had fallen into reductionisms and disciplinarities, which very often did not interrelate or interact with each other. In elevating the idea of the system, in some sense to the level of a master signifier, he defined it as a set of interacting elements organized by a shared boundary or limit. In forming a science which used this concept, his hope was that forms of science which had no grounds for discursive interaction or meaningful interaction would all of a sudden find exciting new frontiers. They would find ways in which their boundaries or limits could operate and organize in new ways, producing new knowledge and more accurately representing the complex society governed by information technology that we live in today. However, I wasn't only inspired by Ludwig von Berta Lanfrey's idea of system science. For a long time, I've also been influenced by continental philosophy. In this text, I was also interested to see, in a meta way, the way in which the boundaries of continental philosophy and the boundaries of system science could meaningfully interact, share language, and perhaps push the frontiers of both towards thinking the problems of the 21st century. In this text, I was interested in exploring the ways in which the work of Martin Heidegger, the work of Sigmund Freud, the work of Friedrich Nietzsche, and the work of Georg Hegel could be meaningfully put into dialogue with the work of system science. Here, I was inspired to include an analysis of Heidegger because of his emphasis on phenomenology, specifically the concept of Dasein, or our being in the world. I think that this concept is necessary to ground any system of abstractions in order to guarantee that they are constantly in some sort of relation or feedback 
with our actual being, or our Dasein. I was inspired to include Sigmund Freud because of the work and the importance of psychoanalysis, the discovery of an unconscious psyche, which has a triadic or tripartite structure, and also the concept of libido, or broadly speaking, sexual energy. Oftentimes, system science, or science in general, can become too abstract and too disconnected from our actual sexual life. I was inspired to include the work of Friedrich Nietzsche because He's such a foundational and pivotal figure in the movement of existentialism, but also a conceptual titan, introducing concepts like the overman and the will to power, which simply have to be understood today in any meaningful system of abstraction. Finally, I included Georg Hegel as perhaps the ultimate logician of modern philosophy. His work, although incredibly difficult, still casts an enormous shadow over the whole of the modern field. I think, in particular, his idea that the absolute must be understood as not only substance, but also subject, is something we have to take extremely seriously. Also, the way in which he understands the dialectics of identity, specifically in relationship to the idea of negativity, is something that I think has still yet to be included in all of our fields of knowledge. My work here is ultimately to put both continental philosophy and system science into a dialogue. Here, the dialogue basically takes place between the main master signifier, the category of the system, as a set of interacting elements organized by a shared boundary and limit, into relationship with some of the foundational principles of continental philosophy. Dasein, our being in the world, the unconscious psyche, organized in a tripartite structure, the overman and the will to power, as well as the negativity of identity. What might come out of such an interrelation? Systems and Subjects wants to find out. The book is organized into four chapters. The first chapter is titled Dasein's Interior and is inspired at the speculative relationship between Heidegger's concepts and Bertalanffy's system science. Specifically here with Heidegger, I'm interested in the way in which he approaches or problematizes the idea of time and finitude for Dasein. Here we're not interested in necessarily the physics of time or the physics of finitude, but rather the way in which time and finitude figure for Dasein or for our being in the world. I think here what Heidegger places front and center is both meaning and our being towards death. Here death is not just some abstract indeterminate point in the future where, of course, we are all going to die, but rather something which is here, present with us right now, something that we can be towards. This brings to my mind an ethics towards death. How do I want to live now in a towardsness towards death? This is key for representing being's meaning and requires that we include, for Heidegger, a pre-ontological, pre-cognitive, and pre-linguistic disposition towards ontology, cognition, and language. It requires that we think about the before of ontology, the before of cognition, the before of linguistics, as opposed to perhaps statically identifying with a particular ontology, a particular form of cognition, or a particular linguistic frame. Here, Heidegger calls us to think about the way in which there's a gap between our given ontologies, what we presuppose about cognition and language. And in this way, the analytic of Dasein is much different than conventional sciences, like, say, physics, biology, or anthropology, where physics, biology, and anthropology all have certain ontologies, certain cognitive presuppositions, and certain language games which regulate their interaction. The analytic of Dasein has to work from the being in the world. It has to engage questions of physics, biology, and anthropology from that perspective, and therefore opens up questions of fundamental ontology, not just a language game within a certain discursive horizon, but rather the discursive horizon as such. We very rarely ask ourselves what the relationship is between fundamental ontology and the meaning of our being. But I think Heidegger, and specifically with this focus on Dasein's interior, 
forces this question upon us and is an interesting way to start to put continental philosophy into relationship with system science. Here, Berta Lanfrey is an intriguing character. In his system science, he formulated the idea of equal final pathways. Equal final pathways basically means that although we all have different beginnings, we all have different origins, we are all born or, in Heideggerian language, thrown into different places and times. We all confront the same result and the same outcome, although inscribing our own difference into that same result or outcome. In other words, we are all going to die. We all have the chance to develop a disposition or a being towards death. But the result of taking up that burden or taking up that responsibility of being towards death will lead to the introduction of a new difference. We will all die in our own way even if the horizon is one we all share. While navigating our equifinal pathway, I think that, for Berta Lanfrey's perspective, the idea of feedback is absolutely central. This might mean, in a Heideggerian sense, that our logos, or our ontologic, requires constant feedback with the being of Dasein. We have to make sure that we do not get caught up into any logical framework or ontologic that our cognition and our language does not remain stuck, as it were, in a static image, but in a constant relation with our being in the world. In affirming this very gap between Logos and Dasein, we might open up what Berta Lanfrey would call negentropic meaning. Negentropic meaning would be Berta Lanfrey's response to the idea that we live in an entropic universe, the idea that we live in a universe which is inherently tending towards disorder. The idea of negentropy can be defined as a negative entropy. Negative entropy would mean that you construct order out of chaos, or that's one way to frame it. The idea of constructing order out of chaos or order out of disorder is, for Bertil Anfrey, the location where meaning can be derived in the very process of designs ununfolding to itself. This means that, for Bertil Anfrey, we are participating in an open constructive mystery. Although it appears that the universe is heading towards disorder, the appearance of ourselves, the appearance of historical subjectivity, presents a constructive mystery that in our very engagement, in our very courage to confront disorder, in our very courage to generate order out of disorder, that is, to become negentropic beings, or even better, negentropic meaningful beings, our process, the mystery of our process, opens us to a horizon which might be the exact opposite of total disorder. It opens us to new qualitative higher order realms of being. In the second chapter, Historical Metapsychology, we shift our focus from Heidegger to Freud. Freud here is an incredibly interesting intellectual figure to situate an analysis of Dasein. Namely because, for Freud, he was interested in our psyches being in the world from the perspective of the unconscious. The unconscious here is not understood as a reservoir of wild instincts, but rather rational thought and speech. In other words, Psychoanalysis introduces a short circuit between what we commonly think of as our rational cogito and our animal being, or our instinctual drives. For psychoanalysis, we have to think about the way our animal instincts are being filtered through our rational cogito, and the drive as such is itself rational, something which thinks and speaks, but in attention with our rational cogito. This introduces us to the way we might think about the mind within the libidinal universe. What is presented to us is a type of binding problem for the instincts or the drives. This binding problem is, in one sense, the lack of the perfect other. The lack of the perfect other which would hold or contain the excess or our free energy of libido. That there is no other or there is no permanent solution is that analysis itself is the tarrying with a binding problem or tarrying with the excess of free energy 
of our libido itself. Here, the whole reason why analysis exists, the whole reason why a subject would demand analysis, is because of its own discontentedness with this binding problem or with this nature of excessive free energy. Here, searching for a type of super egoic injunction or a super egoic container could lead to excessive prohibitions on the excessive free energy and or an excessive demand on enjoyment of this excessive free energy. Of course, there are also paradoxes, like an excessive enjoyment of prohibition and or an excessive enjoyment on breaking or transgressing prohibitions. This nature of the subject within civilization is one of the ways in which we can situate Freud as a thinker of historical metapsychology. Where Bertha Lanfrey comes into the picture is that his work, specifically on the nature of system science, always operates on the level of the symbolic drive. In other words, for Bertha Lanfrey, the drive is not between a biological instinct and a static cognition. The symbolic drive is something which always already has to process biological instincts. We have to understand the systemic relationship between our instincts and our language. Here, we are always left with an unknown reason, which governs the process of individuation. So, for Bertha Lanfrey, actually engaging in the unknown, rationally, is what will help us in the process of individuation, the process of cultivating our psyche for being in an extremely complex world. What this necessitates is a form of knowledge, and here for Bertha Lanfrey, system science is that knowledge, where we can think about intensity and strong relationships. Intensity and strong relationships for Bertha Lanfrey are fundamental to thinking systemically, fundamental to thinking in terms of complexity. Here, Bertha Lanfrey's personal goal was to oppose scientific reductionism, which tried to predict phenomena based on the condition that it reduced phenomena to isolation or weak relationships. When we're thinking in terms of intensity and strong relationships, we lose the capacity for precise prediction and are open to a new level of uncertainty where the best our psyches can do is anticipate. So for Bertha Lanfrey, thinking in terms of intensity, thinking in terms of strong relationships, is something which fits very nicely with both thinking about the psyche as a tripartite structure that interacts very strongly internal to itself, but also thinking about some of the core materials of analysis like familial relationships, friendships, and intensive group formations. Here, Bertha Lanfrey was adamant that we have to think the tension between system and subject. We have to think about the way in which processes of individuation both require society, both require community and groups and ideology, and on the other hand, how these very groups, ideologies, and systems can become a form of parasitic systematic automatization of a free unfolding process of individuation. Although Bertha Lanfrey was thinking in terms of the social systems of his time, which were dealing with political struggles that are perhaps quite different from our time, the same principles which Bertha Lanfrey was thinking in the system science can be thought in regards to our 21st century social environment. Moving on to chapter three, the focus shifts to Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche is perhaps one of the greatest existentialist philosophers and one of the most influential philosophers in general of the entire modern world. Nietzsche's philosophy at its core is about the death of God. It's basically about the missing or the lacking other. For Nietzsche, this was not a cause for celebration, but the cause of an enormous concern. And that concern was related to the imminent politico-theological problems that will emerge in the gap of the death of God. In some sense, you could see Nietzsche as a prophet for the 20th century, where enormous political struggles operated on the meta-horizon of human society between fascism, communism, capitalism, as well as various religions within the context of a global theology or a global religiosity. 
Nietzsche's central concept, the will to power, is here operating within this gap. And in this gap, the entire relationship between historical subjectivity and the way we think about knowledge, truth, and self-overcoming for a higher power has to be understood or situated within the very historicity of the will to power. Here there are often many confusions about the nature of the will to power. The will to power is not the will to overpower other beings, although this is perhaps how it is most often expressed by ordinary consciousness or what Nietzsche will often refer to as the rabble or the political wise men of his day. However, the will to power in itself is first and foremost about setting and overcoming one's own limits, about striving to expand one's own boundaries. And in that sense, there is a deep conversation to be had about the nature of the Nietzschean self and the emergence of system science in the 20th century. Ultimately, for Nietzsche, the goal and the value of the will to power, the goal and the value for the human species, was the very overcoming of the boundary or the limit of the human being itself for the overman. One can see this as in some sense inverting the traditional theological goals of relating to a higher power where instead of thinking about our relationship to a higher power in a transcendental sense in another world, we think about that same problem within this world and in relationship to the overcoming of the human being as such. This is opening a really interesting conversation with Bertrand Free's system science because for Bertrand Free, the birth of systemics or systemic thinking is the birth of a meta science which is not only necessary but also imminent in the condition of death of god philosophy or the absence or decline of religion in the modern world. This meta science is not trying to deconstruct or abolish reductionist science but rather a meta-science which can include within itself subjectivity, and thinking in terms of a sort of circular feedback between systems and subjects. In many ways, the concrete knowledge practices that emerged within the meta-science took on the name of cybernetics, and cybernetics, as is well known, started to approach questions and problems and puzzles which seemed to reflect earlier theological questions, problems, and puzzles, but from a scientific perspective involving purpose, feedback, and general systematization. Here, the problem of time becomes central, and specifically the arrow of time. Here, we could connect this idea to Nietzsche's will to power, that ultimately we cannot will backwards. We are in an irreversible temporal process in relationship to entropy or in relationship to the decay of physical matter. The will to power, however, is also the will to overcome the limitations of nature itself. The will to power is always transgressing, always transcending, and always going beyond itself. Here, the idea of the will to power fits very nicely and very interestingly in a thermodynamics of time that makes sense for both system science and cybernetics. With the tools of Nietzsche's philosophy and also the general systemics which birthed cybernetics and the meta-science approaching formerly theological problems, we can really approach a science or contain a science which has space for individuation. And with individuation as the core of the future of human society and civilization, one could call it the self-organization of the drive. As is well known in contemporary science, self-organization has become its own type of master signifier where we think about self-organization as itself the positive opposition to entropic decay. Instead of the tendency of things to disorder, we have the tendency of things to self-organize in a unique pattern, to maintain internal to itself its own drive. For Bertrand Free, on the human level, this was going to help us think about processes of individuation, and ultimately to avoid a type of reduction of the individual to parasitic social systems which tried to automatize or try to automatically program and predetermine the individuation process which was itself open-ended and which was itself unpredictable, something which could only be anticipated but never absolutely reduced. Finally, we focus on chapter 4, 
titled The Conceptual Absolute. Here, we introduce Hegel, and Hegel's relationship to Bertil Anfrey. Hegel is perhaps the greatest philosopher of the modern world, and his philosophy, in some sense, still casts an enormous shadow over all of modern knowledge. For Hegel, we had to think about the absolute not only as substance, but also as subject. In other words, we're not just thinking about a pre-modern, mythical, or mystical substance, but also the way in which this pre-modern, mystical, or mythical substance becomes the modern free subject, opening up the question of rights and individual rights, which are so crucial for processes of individuation, and also critical for the maturation of the human species as a whole. When we are only thinking about the absolute as a substance, we can forget about developmental processes of maturation and individuation. When we think about the absolute as substance and also subject, we can no longer ignore this question. We also have to think about the very developmental processes of individuation and subjectivity. This requires a type of growing up in the confrontation with absolute negativity, that our identity is never complete, but always open to processes of becoming what it always already is. There is a fundamental relationship between being and nothing, or identity and non-identity. And understanding the relationship between being and nothing, or identity and non-identity, is crucial to understand the becoming of the absolute as substance and also subject. Here, we open up to the possibilities of concrete determination, as opposed to simple, abstract, universal determination. When we're thinking in terms of abstract universal determination, we miss this dimension in which the universal moves through the particular to the singular form of subjectivity. When we move from the abstract universal through the particular to a concrete singular form of historical subjectivity, we are thinking about not just determinism in a physics framework, but the concrete determination of historical subjectivity itself. It's unfolding individuations and it's real of freedom. In relationship to Berta Lanfrey, we can here think about Berta Lanfrey's own form of conceptual realism, where material substance, however it's systematized, whether it's systems in terms of physics, systems in terms of biology, or systems in terms of psychology and sociology, these systems are always in relationship to an abstract subject. In other words, there's always a relationship between system and subject. Here, the subject has to confront its own abstract death, or the death of its own abstract universality. Here it is not that we cannot construct, or that we are not constructors, but rather we have to understand the way in which what we can construct is always found in its own limitation, that everything we construct will eventually succumb to its own finitude and mortality. One of the paradoxical shifts in understanding this is that what is perceived as a negativity or a limitation, our own finitude and mortality, becomes itself an enormous liberating power, where we see that the becoming of reality as such, or even becoming as immortality, finds its power in limitation and finitude as opposed to running away from it. In finding our strength in limitation and finitude, we start to become determined. This is not a determinism of Newton, but a process of determinism which includes a process of genuine open-ended becoming. Positive existence is the result of a long, concrete work of a self-conceptual process. We find ourselves at this historical moment as the result of this long process. However, and at the same time, we must participate in this process. We must learn what our own self-limitations are, we must learn our own thrownness into the historicity of our condition in order to carry on our great tradition, not only as human beings, but also in overcoming human beings, not just in reifying our positive identity, but engaging in the negativity of our identity for the mystery of reality itself, or in Heideggerian sense, that Dasein must confront or open to the way our meaningful being is in relationship with questions and problems of fundamental ontology. Here, the work of Bertil Anfrey and the emergence of system science, as well as the history of continental philosophy expressed in this book through the work of Heidegger, Freud, Nietzsche, and Hegel, can help us to confront this mystery with a set of tools, a set of concepts, and a set of methods that will allow us to think in a new way, 
to think about the interconnections of being and also our relationship to being without either falling on one side of two extremes. One side being a type of reductive scientism, which is isolating parts and unable to really confront strong, intense relations. And on the other hand, to leave the world, to identify with a type of transcendental mystical one, which obfuscates problems of being in the world, obfuscates problems of the unconscious psyche, obfuscates the nature of power, and also the irreducible negativity of identity. If we're willing to take the history of continental philosophy seriously, and if we're willing to put it into conversation with a new form of science, specifically a system science, which is not just thinking in terms of reduced substances, but thinking of their interconnection, thinking about general systemness. I think that a whole new way of seeing the world, the whole new way of seeing each other, is bound to emerge as a result. This, in any case, was the hope for this book, Systems and Subjects, Thinking the Foundations of Science and Philosophy. If you're interested in diving into the specific details of this book, which are only outlined in a general framework in this presentation, you'll find a link to both a free preview of the book, as well as a link to the actual book itself in the description below. Thanks for your time, thanks for your attention, and I hope you enjoy Systems and Subjects.